Amen. So that's good. Uh, all right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We just dedicate this time. We set apart this time and in this place to meet with you together in the name of Jesus. And you've promised where we come to meet in your name, you will be right there in our midst. And we, we come, Lord, to hear your words through your servant, James, that you have given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to your church. And so we ask you for illumination, for understanding, um, for wisdom, and we believe in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just start at the beginning here again. And uh, we talked a lot about the beginning part, but we're just going to read through and uh, pick up where we're at. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. And now we read this message from James here in Texas. My brethren, count it all joy or an opportunity for joy when you fall into various trials, troubles, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, patience, endurance. But this, is, this word means steadfastness. How many know that we are to be, as Christians, steadfast? Even as we talked about being sanctified by faith, we're set apart for God to be steadfast, no longer to be flaky, no longer to be nutty, fruity, but to be steadfast, uh, now, no longer to be unfaithful, but now faithful, no longer hit or miss, right? But let patience or endurance, steadfastness have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. He'll give to you wisdom generously and without uh, reproaching you that you didn't have the wisdom. You didn't know it. Then it says, uh, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. It will is, uh, there's no if, and, or but that uh, is very certain. It will be given him. Verse 6 says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts... This is the Greek word duo, and this is a divided loyalty, or to be two-minded, duo-minded. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, uh, James says that the person who doesn't ask in faith, you know, while doubting, if, if he doesn't ask in faith with doubting, then he shouldn't expect to receive from God even what he might be asking for. So what might be a reason someone might even ask God for something and not receive it? Doubt? Yeah, not asking in faith? And yeah, not for the glory of God? And, and But explicitly in the, in the context here, uh, he says if he doesn't ask in faith, he shouldn't expect to receive anything. In other words, he must understand he won't receive from, from God. Um, and so there can be different reasons why he doesn't ask in faith, a divided loyalty. Or uh, also, um, you know, in the, in the Gospels, Jesus would say, you know, sometimes they said, why couldn't we do that? Or, and, and, and Jesus said, because of your lack of faith. Or sometimes he said, why is your faith so small? And he knew exactly where people's faith was. Uh, you may not always know exactly um, as you listen to people, you, they can kind of locate themselves. Um, 
sometimes people will give diagnoses to other people. <laughs> like, well, your problem is, when really, if you do have a diagnosis, just do what can help them. Sometimes giving a, sometimes even medical doctors don't like to give the name of a diagnosis. I know this in training with Ruth. She, they, they, she said, first of all, you're not even qualified. And, uh, and to understand someone's walk, um, I mean, Jesus is preeminently qualified to address everything going on with someone. Um, and you may see something, and so work to help that area rather than uh, sometimes we want to, like sometimes people will ask, well, how come in that situation it didn't work? How come that Christian died or fell back into sin or... Um, and sometimes we just want to tie things neatly in a bow, and we want to be able to uh, kind of label. And I found that God is not as interested in that as a lot of times people are. But sometimes you can label something for people and actually kind of throw a stumbling block. And so let's say James is working with somebody... Um, now, he, he kind of tells them, generally, you need to ask in faith. But to ask in faith isn't just a matter of, okay, I'm just going to hold on and just wait a moment before I ask until I feel faith. No, that's not, it's not just a matter of, oh, I didn't ask in faith last time, this time I will. There has to be ground for faith. And so if someone didn't ask in faith, and so therefore they didn't receive, Something has to change. Something has to happen so that they do ask in faith. And so what has to change? Right, but how, do, how are we going to get there? How are they going to have faith this time when they ask? Yeah, faith here comes by hearing. They need to receive a, a revelation, understanding. And so sometimes Christians kind of can even offend another Christian and say, well, your problem is you don't have enough faith. And there can be other variables going on, too. And Jesus does do that, and it can be correct. And you could even be correct in saying that to someone. But that just telling them what their problem is doesn't necessarily help them. And you could be wrong in, in, in telling them. Because there can be some other situations, too, like Mark eleven twenty five. Uh, forgive those who've uh, trespassed against you, uh, or God won't forgive you. In other words, and there could be an issue of forgiveness with someone. Maybe they do have faith, but they have an issue of forgiveness. So there's more than one variable going on that can be a blockage for somebody. But if you do see an area where somebody needs to build, uh, give them some bricks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that so g you could generally say that someone has a lack of faith and, and and their problem is that they're believing something wrong about themselves, about God, about other people, about God's will. There there's some area where they're missing something or they're believing something wrong. And so ask the Lord if, if you discern that they have a lack of faith, ask the Lord how to help them. Uh, what do they need a revelation of? Uh, maybe that, like, like Tanya mentioned, maybe they don't believe they're worthy to receive what they've even asked for. And if you don't believe that you should have it, it's like you may, may even work to sabotage. Yeah, and so, and so we can even, if you do have faith to ask God for wisdom, 
ask God for wisdom even in how to help someone who hasn't had the faith to ask for it. Does that make sense? And how to encourage them and how to supply them with what they need um, and a lot of different uh, situations. And uh, and there, there can be some work there. And so share the revelation, understanding of the word of God with, share some wisdom of God with them. And, uh, and that can help them get to the place where they are going to be able to ask in faith when they ask. Amen? So just a little practical thing there we can get from James. But sometimes Christians are too quick to diagnose and tell people the diagnosis. <laughs> And, and then now they have to, they, they may have now the issue of being stuck with that diagnosis when the, when the solution was actually very simple to the situation of believing the wrong thing or not knowing uh, God's will about something. Like James saying very clearly here, if you ask God for wisdom, he gives to all generously. And, and somebody could believe, well, if I ask God for wisdom, he's just going to humiliate me. He's just going to show me what an idiot I've been. <laughs> and they don't know. And, and partially because the devil's trying to sow wrong beliefs into people. And so we don't want to cooperate with the devil in doing that. But we want to help people uh, walk in faith. But definitely, um, now what is the opposite of what James says here? Uh, for let not that man, the man that doesn't ask in faith, uh, and he is doubting, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. But let's say we do ask in faith without doubting. So what's the opposite case of what James says here? Well, then we will receive from the Lord. Amen. Amen. And uh, he says this, and notice he says he, that he shouldn't suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. In other words, not only just in the thing he's asked for God about, but because he's unstable and flaky in all his ways, he's not going to have lasting success in anything he's trying to do. But if we're loyal, single-minded commitment to Jesus... If we do believe him and ask God for wisdom and he gives us the wisdom, we're actually going to be stable in all our ways. And so that should be the goal here is that even in, in spite of various trials and testings, um, the reason we can count an opportunity for joy is because we're going to be stable in all our ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love that. Then verse uh, 9, he gets into different kinds of testings. He says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation or the poor one. How many know that poverty can, be, can test you? And one kind of testing is poverty. Every, you know, everybody, maybe you've heard the saying, I've been poor and I've been rich. I like rich better. <laughs> now, he says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. In other words, uh, he understands that he's received riches that are much better than physical riches to be born again, to know Jesus, and he has eternity of being blessed, right? Right? And then he says, verse 10, but the rich in his humiliation. So what's another test? Prosperity. And so the rich are tested in, uh, with prosperity and to not be deceived by the deceitfulness of riches. Now, you could be deceived by the deceitfulness of riches and not have riches. Or you can be deceived by the deceitfulness of riches and, and have riches. But so he says that the one who is rich uh, exalt or glory. So according to the wisdom tradition in Proverbs that James writes really in that style, 
it wasn't wrong to glory completely, but to glory without ground, or, or in other words, what ground you're glorying in. You know, that we shouldn't glory in ourselves, but um, and so he says the, the rich should glory in his humiliation, that the rich receives Christ the same way the poor man does. And, and stands before Christ uh, with no advantage for his money uh, in his relationship with Christ. The money doesn't count for anything with him. I mean, he created it all. And so he should uh, glory in his humiliation and recognize this, that as a flower of the field, that will pass away. And so he said, James paints this picture, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat. This is this desert wind. Uh, and if you remember the story of Jonah, when the gourd grew up, the plant grew up to shade him, and then the desert wind caused it to wither up. This desert wind, that in Israel the flowers are there for a short time, and then the desert wind dries it and withers it all up. And this is the picture that James gives. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And so if that's what the person is living for and he doesn't humble himself and, and get true riches from Christ, then those natural riches uh, will fade away. And then verse 12 says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. So, so check it out. There's temptations, there's testings, no matter what your circumstances. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, the key is to uh, walk in the will of God, to walk humbly, to glory in Christ, not in yourself, right? Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And then he says this, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And so in other words, number one, we need to get this very clear. God doesn't do evil. He doesn't, he's not the source of evil. He doesn't tempt anyone with evil. And there are theological systems that will say that God decrees that men will do evil. And this is not biblical. Right here, James destroys that concept and says that God doesn't, uh, he's not tempted to evil. He doesn't tempt anyone to do evil. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And so notice this, that you can be tempted, you can have the desire and not yet have sin. That's a, a huge revelation right there. Sometimes we don't even want to acknowledge or admit that we're tempted in something uh, because we kind of think, well, that would be sin. But notice what it, he says. He says, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And uh, that's when desires lead you to the action. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Notice, in other words, you know, there's a saying that helps you with this. God doesn't settle up every Saturday night. And this is one of the deceptions that, that uh, are very deceptive to the sinner is that the first few sins, they don't see any immediate consequence or repercussion. But the death is coming. And so notice that the sin gets full grown before the death comes. It brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So everything in this world, everything in life that is really good comes from God. 
He's the one you should receive it from. So that should help you also to reject temptations uh, of acquiring something in a way that God has not given you in something that Satan tempts you with, like Eve with the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, if God isn't giving it to me, he, every good and perfect gift comes from him, not from snakes, <laughs> right? So don't take fruit from snakes. <laughs> yeah, 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 give, receive from God what he gives and at, at the time he gives it. Amen. There's the story of a, a woman. Uh, she was praying for a husband, and, and she met a man, and she asked the Lord, and the Lord said, no, wait. But she kind of liked him, and she prayed again, asked him again, Lord, can, can I marry this man? And God was giving her a red light. But she kept on praying, and finally God said, she kept on asking about, the, can I marry this man? And God said, well, marry him, go ahead. But it wasn't, that's the perfect will for your life. God said, if you're going to keep on pushing for what you want, you can have what you want. But I already told you no. That happened with Balaam. Balaam asked, should I go uh, and, and curse Israel? And God said, no. Well, then the next day he asked again. How many of you know that you don't have to keep asking once God already told you the answer? <laughs> yeah, the answer doesn't change. Uh, my dad said me, no means no. <laughs> Don't keep asking. And, uh, and actually that shows a, a, a willfulness and even a rebellion and an unbelief in God's answer because it wasn't what you wanted it to be. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so you don't want something you think is good uh, not coming from God. Amen. Because if it doesn't come from him, actually it's not good. It's not a perfect gift. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. That we might be, in other words, it was his idea this is a good and perfect gift that he has brought us forth by the word of truth. And so he sent his word of truth that we would be born again. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. First fruits of the restoration of all things. And, and by first fruits, we're also then the witnesses of all he's going to accomplish. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man, well, wait a minute, Pastor, but, you know, I'm Sicilian. You know, I have a quick fuse. <laughs> With every instruction that God gives, there is grace to do it. So when God says, be slow to wrath, you can actually be slow to wrath. And so we have to reprogram. We've got to change our identity, our way of thinking, and start saying, I'm slow to wrath. And uh, the devil might start, you know, cackling, oh, yeah, you're... <laughs> no, that's old. That's the old... Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creature. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, and, and woman, be swift to hear, <laughs> slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow or increase of wickedness, how many know that wickedness, the natural tendency of wickedness is to increase? Because the harvest is in the seed. When you sow sin, it will mature and it brings forth a fruit. 
and then the fruit is the seed within the fruit itself. And so when you sin, you actually produce a harvest that has seed in it, and so you have a new crop. And so when it comes to sin, you need to have a crop failure. Amen. Now, the other way is true that the fruit of righteousness has the seed of righteousness in it. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And look at this, even think of it this way in the context of this verse. Verse. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And uh, In other words, uh, save your souls from the increase of wickedness. And to sow a harvest of uh, righteousness, a crop of righteousness. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And especially in our Western world with a Greek mindset. In the Greek mindset, when we, uh, we think that when we know something or that when we intellectually can understand something, we think that when we've learned something, we, we have done something. <laughs> so when you graduate from high school, you think you've accomplished something, but you actually haven't done anything yet. You just learned a few things to prepare you to do something. But we think we've accomplished something. We've uh, finished a, a season of learning. And the point, the purpose of that is to prepare you to do something. And so the Hebrew mindset is uh, learning for the purpose of doing. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. And, and especially, to, you know, the Bible says don't be, uh, and so in the, in the end of times, people will heap unto themselves, teachers, uh, to, to tickle their ears. And we could announce, yeah, we're going we're gonna to teach on the book of James. Yeah, I've read James. I've heard James before. I'm not going to go to that. I've, I've read James. <laughs> and so, but the Bible isn't something that we hear once, but we, we devote ourselves, we meditate on it, we, we do it. And, uh, you know, so I used to be a mechanic, and uh, oftentimes a mechanic would have a, like a, a mechanic book that has all the details about a particular car. And when you're doing uh, a procedure, you're constantly checking in the manual in the Chilton's uh, book on the model, the year, the make of your, your car that you're working on, and, and you go work on it, and you can check your Chilton's, you can go work on it, you check your Chilton's, or today you go look at YouTube, <laughs> and you back it up and watch it again. Because when you're learning something that you're going to do, you pay much closer attention to the details and uh, you look at it again and again and again. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Man, if, if the world's, I mean, the devil's out there, he's called the deceiver of the world. But not only is the devil out there deceiving, uh, we can deceive ourselves too. And so the way we can deceive ourselves in this context is we can say, well, I heard it, so I've got it. But how many of you know that uh, you could hear a lecture on how to fly an airplane, and then you crawl in the cockpit, and you're like, <laughs> you don't got it. <laughs> you need to repetition, applying what you're hearing, repeatedly hearing, uh, and you're tested and questioned uh, until you've got it. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. In other words, we, we go away, and uh, you can go to many Christians and, uh, on Thursday and say, hey, what did the pastor preach on Sunday? Bah, 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 bah. 
Uh, <laughs> that's why it's a good idea to take notes, read them afterwards, talk with somebody afterwards. Uh, there's a practice Andy and Linda do with Jake. And as a family, they'll talk about the message they heard on Sunday. That's good. And uh, Christine and I will talk about it afterwards. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful here. Now notice what James calls the word of God, the perfect law of liberty. And so this is God's law. In fact, the first five books of the Bible are called often translated what's called the Torah, which is, means the way. Uh, but it's often translated law, although there's more than laws in the first five books. But really, everything that God says is law because he is the lawgiver. And everything he says is true and right. Amen? So God's law is a perfect law. And so it's been horrible in our days. We, we, we were told by the Bible that there will be doctrines of demons, that people will uh, they'll be teaching, deceiving. And uh, there's a pastor of a mega church that years ago was saying, we need to unhook from the Old Testament. And then now he's having a conference with gay, uh, you know, homosexual, LGBTQ uh, ministers telling people that they can, that that's not a problem. And so that's being a forgetful hearer, of course, I mean, very much so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but notice this says, but he who looks into the perfect law, so it's a perfect law, but notice something else that produces liberty. God's law will produce liberty from sin. And uh, if we as a society, if we as a group, if, uh, if you follow God's perfect law and I leave my iPad there and I'm somewhere else, if you follow God's perfect law, my things are at liberty. I mean, if, if somebody steals it, then that impinges on my liberty. And to another extent, the perfect law says you shall not murder. And uh, by not murdering you, uh, you have liberty. Amen? So God's perfect law produces liberty in relationships in a society, it perfectly produces liberty. That's funny because uh, a lot of times uh, people think of law, and there are laws, man's law, that are burdensome, that produce bondage. But God's laws don't produce bondage, rightly interpreted, rightly applied. They produce liberty. And so James is speaking to Messianic believers, showing God's law walked out uh, according to God's purpose is the ideal for the Christian to walk out, to walk in love, which is what the law instructs us to do. How many know that a lot of people will say, well, a Christian, we should walk in love, but they'll... Uh, redefine what love is. So he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now, if someone actually does what the law, the perfect law of liberty says will bring death, then they won't be blessed in what they do because they're not doing what they saw in the perfect law of liberty. 
If anyone among you thinks he is religious, now religious kind of, when James writes this and it was translated religious, this is a good word. <laughs> it means to have a spiritual relationship with God and, and a consistent spiritual relationship with God. If anyone among you thinks they are spiritual and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And so this is interesting, too. Um, earlier, when he talked about the, the, the double-minded person, they're driven and tossed by the, the, the wave of the sea. Well, if your tongue is controlled, uh, in the rest of the book of James and another place in the book of James we'll get to, James says that your tongue is like the rudder of your ship. And so you will be in the same wind, wave, tossed ocean. But if your rudder is controlled as the, uh, as the captain of the ship is steering it, then you're, st you're not driven wherever the wind and the waves toss you. But you're uh, following, your rudder is piloting your course through the sea. I mean, if you're in a ship, and, and J.J., of course, was... Uh, floating on military ships in the ocean, and uh, the captain would just say, well, the wind's blowing northwest, so we're going to go northwest today. <laughs> no, they would set the course that they were ordered to go, and they go that course regardless of which way the waves are or the wind is going. Amen. And uh, we've driven, Christine and I were actually in a, a race with sailboats in the Caribbean, and she was actually steering. She was controlling that rudder. I was uh, controlling the sails. And uh, we had a, a course that we're going around buoys. And uh, no matter which way the wind was going, just we would change how our sail was. And Christine would steer the rudder. And then we would uh, navigate the course of the race. And we won. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, she, she did all the steering, and, and uh, the captain from Argentina was right there next to her, and uh, he, the captain from Argentina, he spoke very quickly, very fast. Oh, yeah, my, I uh, the pay, turned the page there. Okay. So, yeah, 26. Well, let's read 25 again. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, notice again, notice again that this is a this picture of someone deceiving their own heart. Then, you know, there's a psalm that talks about people that said, uh, my tongue is my own, my lips are my own, I, I, I say what I feel. I say what I want. But that's not actually how we are to live. We are to control our tongue. Well, I just got to keep it real. I just got to say what I feel. That's actually a picture of someone who doesn't control their tongue. <laughs> and uh, pure and undefiled religion uh, before God and the Father is this. And actually, and, and what he said before, if someone does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is used. In other words, his relationship, his, his religion is not producing the results it's supposed to because he's not controlling his own tongue. He's living according to how he feels, not according to how God instructs. Yeah, yeah. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. All right, chapter 2. Any questions so far where we're at or comments? Wow, yes, yes. Again, James is very practical and, and he's very interested 
in us being mature. Amen. Oh, yes. Yes. Right, yeah. Yes, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And that shows you not only what we should be doing, but what God's will is, right? That you see the love of God there. All right, let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. With partiality. By the way, if, if James is saying this, then God himself is not showing partiality. For if there should come into your assembly, now this word here is the word synagogue. Synagogue. Now this is, these are synagogues that he's addressing of where messianic believers are in charge of the synagogue. And synagogue in the, uh, in the Septuagint uh, translated the Hebrew word for assembly as synagogue. So he's talking about messianic uh, assemblies of believers. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel. And there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit there at my footstool. You sit on the floor there. <laughs> now picture this. Really what he's depicting is you're having a, a, a messianic synagogue and this is a someone who's coming. Uh, they're probably Jewish because that's... Now, there were Gentiles that would come to synagogues too. Uh, so whether they're Jewish or Gentile, they're not probably yet a believer in Christ. They need to hear the gospel. And uh, so the wealthy one comes in and, and you give them a place of honor. And you, you need to preach the gospel to them. They need to repent of their sins and believe the gospel. But, you're, it, but what he's describing here is that the, that the messianic church is really, why, so first of all, why would they give the place of honor to the man with the gold rings and the fine apparel? The, the nice suit, the, uh, the Armani suit. <laughs> yeah, because... Maybe they're going to benefit from this person somehow. Maybe, that, you know, that could be something. Or just because. So it says, uh, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit there at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality? Respective persons, you know. In other words, shown favoritism to someone. Amen. And become judges with evil thoughts. So James says, if this is what you're doing, you're, you become, you're, you're becoming judges with evil thoughts. You're judging between them uh, and, and judging incorrectly uh, between these two different people. And uh, so especially in their time, a, a lot of poor people received the gospel and were born again. And then our brethren in Christ. Now, in the Jewish world, a lot of the rich Jews were having them arrested, and which James will uh, point out. 
Listen, verse 5, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? So this connects back to what he said in chapter 1. Uh, let the, the poor brother rejoice or glory in his exaltation. Now, this is the exaltation that he was talking about. That God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which are promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. So that's a big lesson right there that there's more to a person than how much money he has or what clothes they're wearing. They're, that, that they're created in the image of God and, and people are to be honored because they're people, not because of their clothes or their jewelry. Yes. I, I, I agree, yes. He's correcting something that has happened, yes. Yeah. And, and uh, in Jewish culture, to be wealthy was, was, was something honored and something to uh, seen as blessing from God. I mean, if you look back at Abraham, he was rich and he was blessed. Job was rich and, uh, and had faith in God. And so it's not an automatic that a rich person isn't humble and doesn't have faith in God. But, yeah. Go ahead. Right. Could be generous. Yes. There's very famous stories about some very rich families that were, as, were stingier than you could imagine. Uh it's just amazing. People with uh, amazing fortunes and, and exceedingly, unimaginably stingy, uh, even to family members, and, and uh, just amazing. Right, right. Yes, <laughs> rich men north of Richmond. Yes. Yes. Right. We could we could think also we could also be judges with evil thoughts if we if we think that all poor people are more honorable than all rich people. That could be uh an error also. Yes. And sometimes churches and Christians only want to target poor people to minister to when everyone needs to be ministered to. So he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to, to be rich in faith and heirs? And, and so those who are rich, who recognize their spiritual poverty, will then be rich in faith when they recognize that. And they'll humble themselves and recognize that their money doesn't get them anywhere with God. And I've met rich people that are very humble, and and uh, loving and, and generous and uh, so he says uh, and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him but you have dishonored the poor man then he says this do not the rich and in the context of which he's written writing during this persecution as these messianic believers have been scattered even because of perse persecution by rich Jews. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? So these are probably primarily what he's writing about is rich Jewish people in the cities where they are who actually get have them. And we see that throughout the book of Acts with Paul and his team where they get arrested and do they not blaspheme that noble name? What noble name? Jesus. And they blaspheme against Jesus, by which you are called. And then he says in verse 8, if you really fulfill, this is interesting, notice what he says, the royal law. 
What's a, what is a royal law? Yes, it's a law that is given by a king. And in God's kingdom, there is the king who gives his law, and so it's a royal law given by the king of the kingdom of God. Our God is a king. Jesus is a king, right? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so he says this command you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He calls that a royal law given by the king of the kingdom that we're citizens of. And if we're citizens of his kingdom, it's a law that we should follow. Now, uh, in my Bible here, uh, up here, it's, it's in quotation marks. So in other words, he's quoting that from somewhere. And so where is he quoting this from? Jesus says it, yes. But, it, but Jesus isn't the first person who, who uh, Jesus said it because he was asked what are the greatest commandments in the law. And so he's just answering uh, that commandment. He said the second is like it. And uh, which one of the Ten Commandments is this one? That's a trick question, sorry. <laughs> it's not. It's not one of the Ten Commandments. No. What is it? Let's go back and look in Leviticus. He's quoting from Leviticus 19. Now, the first great commandment that Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your strength. He was quoting that from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is said right after the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love him with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind. So Leviticus 19, and uh, let me see. Yeah. So, verse 9. When you reap, is everybody there? Leviticus 19 and verse 9. I'm waiting. Leviticus 19. And verse 9. And verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. In other words, don't wring out every last piece of harvest. Don't The corners that are hard to reach in harvesting, uh, leave those. And the things that fell on the ground... Don't go back and pick all, every last one of them up. And why is that? You're leaving that for the poor. And there's a lesson here that, that according to God's instruction, uh, business or uh, industry should provide for the poor. And, and, and uh, yes, and, and that sets you free from being greedy. Right. Right. That is, yeah, yes, that it's not a profit, 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 profit. I mean, wring out every last drop of profit. Yeah, can be greed, yeah. So he, where are we at here? Uh, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. Why not? Because you're letting other people have some of your grapes. You're sharing, Yes. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. What does that mean at the bottom? That where do, at that last statement, what does that mean? This is why James calls it a royal law. I am the Lord your God. I'm the one telling you to do this. So do this because I am the Lord your God. In other words, I have the authority to say this and govern how you harvest. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, he's the one that gave the, the harvest to you. Right. Yeah, very good. Then look at what it says. Uh, and he says, you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. And so this is talking about your relationship with other people. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. 
You shall not cheat your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. In other words, when someone has earned their pay, don't delay in paying them. These are some good, these are some good uh, commands to follow that, that bring liberty for the people who work for you and for you. And as you pay them promptly and reward them, they're, they're going to they're gonna love you, <laughs> right? Yeah, and if you don't cheat your neighbor, he's less likely to cheat you. But do you see how this produces liberty in every relationship? Uh, verse uh, 14, you shall not curse the deaf. <laughs> what is it? What, what do you mean curse the deaf? You know, it's like making fun. You would curse them by, they can't even hear me, so I'm just going to say whatever because they can't even hear what I say. It's kind of mocking their disability or, you know, actually causing them harm because they're deaf. It's very good. Nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial. Whoa, here we go. So when James is quoting, and this is uh, uh, the Jewish way of doing things, you quote from a verse, you mean for the people to understand the whole passage that he's quoting from. So when James says, don't hold your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with partiality, and so he's, he's pointing us back to Leviticus 19 when God said, uh, this issue of being partial, you shall not be, but he says it this way, you shall not be partial to the poor. And the reverse would be true, you should not be partial to the rich. Do you know that politics in our world today is to appeal to the poor and envy to have power? And, and a lot of politics today, politics today is to appeal to the poor to hate the rich. And sometimes even by the rich. <laughs> All while they're gleaning, yes, every bit of the harvest, yes. <laughs> right. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor. In other words, how much money they have doesn't matter when it comes to judgment. And this is what James is quoting. The poor or the rich doesn't matter. They're made in God's image. Preach the gospel to them. Amen. You should not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. So this would appeal to apply to the rich one then. So here in this verse, he says, don't be partial to the poor or don't honor the, the mighty because they're mighty or, or, or the rich. The rich have a might in, in their wealth. It says, in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about uh, a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. John the Apostle quotes this in his letters. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You know what he's saying there? You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely correct your, or confront your neighbor. In other words, he's saying if you fail to confront your neighbor about your neighbor's sin, you hate them. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. In other words, because of their sin. And if you fail to rebuke them, now you have sinned because of them. <laughs> yeah, you haven't corrected them. You haven't spoken to them in love. Right. Um, 
you shall uh, and da, 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 da. you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. Now here's the line that he quoted in uh, James chapter two. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is why he calls it the royal law, because the Lord said it. And what God spoke here in Leviticus is Jesus speaking. And today, sometimes people think, well, if I don't find the quote from Jesus in the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark, then Jesus doesn't care about it. And that's not true. And so James is quoting uh, and, and applying to this New Testament messianic church how they're treating people, and he corrects it with the law in Moses, which is teaching people how to love people. So sometimes when Paul says you fulfill the, the law by walking in love, by loving your brother, sometimes Christians today will say, so today in the New Testament we just love people and we don't need the Old Testament commandments. When actually the Old Testament commandments were telling you how to love your neighbor. And so James is reminding them and applying to them Old Testament commands. And actually Jesus said this one, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. Jesus said that was the second greatest command in all the Torah. <laughs> Interesting, right? In Leviticus 19, and in that passage where it says you shall love your neighbor uh, as yourself, I am the Lord, in the context of it, he says, don't be partial to the poor or the rich. And so this is a ready-made text for James to apply to the New Testament church who was doing just that. <laughs> Amen. And it's still, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So uh, now here's a, just to say this really quick. Um, the, the Ten Commandments, the, 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 ra the sages would say, uh, all the other commandments are extrapolated from them. So this command is found in the Ten Commandments, not explicitly stated as it is here, but the first five commandments on the one tablet all have to do with loving your creator. Number five is honor your father and mother. They're your natural creators. And God, the first four, is your ultimate creator. The second five on the other tablet all have to do with your relationship with other people. And they all relate to you loving other people, your neighbor. So your, your most important neighbor that you have is God. And you actually are some kind, sometimes people take the Ten Commandments and say, well, the, the second five are applicable to society, but the first five, that's just religious, and they don't apply to society. Actually, they do. Because God is in our society. And he's the most important neighbor that you have. If you ignore the first five, you're not loving God who is your neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, yes, the Holy Spirit, yeah. And so we're members of him. So the first five commandments and the ten are about loving God. The second five are about loving your neighbor. So that in essence... It is in the second five, you shall not, if you love your, you know, this is what Paul said, if you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't murder them. If you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't steal from them. If you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't uh, have adultery with their wife. You wouldn't covet their, their mule. And now today, that's a four-wheel drive ranch vehicle. <laughs> and a lot of people on ranches want to have a mule. <laughs> So, 
Now, Jesus said this is one of the two greatest commandments, and James's half-brother said this uh, is, is like unto the first one, love the Lord your God. So in those answers that Jesus gave are encapsulated all of the Ten Commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. And so this is what James quotes to bring correction to a New Testament church. Now, remember what we said, this is actually the first New Testament book. There isn't any other New Testament books that he could draw from. <laughs> He's writing the first one. And, and uh, throughout this book, He's taking different portions and applying to different topics. And so James's letter is a topical sermon. It's not an expository sermon. Now, we're doing expository sermon with James, but even in our expository sermon, in other words, to go verse by verse through a book of the Bible, that's an expository sermon. Within that expository sermon of going through James, we're preaching a topical sermon. So even if you do expository, you're also doing topical. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's too late for that. Kind of inside preacher baseball there. <laughs> All right, let's stop right there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. It's so nice in Texas to hear rain on a tin roof. Thank you for sending refreshment, Lord. Thank you for giving life-giving water to the earth. And thank you, Lord, for raining your word upon us tonight through your servant, James, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to hear and do what we've heard tonight and apply it in our lives. Help us not to show favoritism. Help us to control our tongues. We thank you, Lord, for giving us light. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, the love of God, and the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.